A British student's life sentence for spying in the United Arab Emirates. As friends of Matthew Hedges, his university and government leaders in London all protest his innocence, is it all a major misunderstanding or evidence of a larger problem of academic and political freedom in the Emirates? This is Inside Story. Hello there and welcome to the programme. I'm Laura Kyle. Matthew Hedges has spent the last seven months in prison in the UAE. Now he faces the prospect of staying there forever. The university postgraduate student was given a life sentence on Wednesday for spying. The Emiratis say he made a full confession. His family says the document he signed was in Arabic and he didn't understand it. Government leaders in Abu Dhabi say they're considering a request from his wife for clemency. Like the UK, the UAE is a country with an independent judiciary. The government does not dictate verdicts to the court. Matthew Hedges was not convicted after a five-minute short trial, as some have reported. Over the course of one month, three judges evaluated compelling evidence in three hearings. They reached their conclusion after a full and proper process. This was an extremely serious case. We live in a dangerous neighborhood, and national security must be a top priority. This was also an unusual case. Many researchers visit the UAE freely every year without breaking our laws. <clears throat> Under UAE law, everyone has the right to appeal for after conviction, and everyone can request a pardon from our president. Mr. Hedge's family have made a request for clemency and the government is studying that request. Well, Hedges is a student at Durham University in Northern England. He flew to the Emirates to research the UAE's security policies after the Arab Spring. Paul Brennan has more from London on the government response. They called the ambassador in to the Foreign Office in London on Thursday evening. The Foreign Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, uh, then tweeted on social media uh, after that meeting. He said that the, uh, the uh, I believe and trust that the Foreign Minister is working hard to resolve the situation ASAP. And Daniela Tejada, who is Matthew Hedges' wife, also had a meeting at the Foreign Office on Thursday afternoon in which she softened her criticism, her earlier criticism, and said that she too believed that the diplomatic wheels really were turning now. And that appears to be the, the glimmer of hope moving forward. A face-saving exercise appears to be taking shape where the UAE say that under its strict laws, Matthew Hedges uh, was guilty as charged. But at the same time, they probably will accept that he was not uh, having any malicious intent. He certainly was not uh, a spy. In the words of Daniela Tejada, who gave a very brief uh, statement after that uh, ambassador statement on Friday morning, she said, we will wait and see. Paul Brennan, Inside Story. Well, Matthew Hedge's wife, Daniela, has been describing the scene in court on Wednesday when his brief hearing ended in a life sentence. Seeing him shaken in court after being handed a life sentence and then being made to leave was beyond heartbreaking. We didn't even get to say goodbye. I really appreciate the Foreign Secretary taking the time to meet me at this crucial point in my and Matt's life. He has assured me that he and his team are doing everything in their power to get my, Matt free and return him home to me. This is not a fight I can win alone, and I thank the Foreign Office and the British public who are now standing up for one of their citizens. Well, Hedges' story highlights an issue that has arisen repeatedly in different forms. On one side, what some see as the Emirates' narrow and conservative approach to security and public morality. Set against that, the open, modern and tolerant image that the UAE generally, and Dubai in particular, seeks to project to the wider world. Well, let's bring in our guest now. And joining me here in the studio, Mark Owen-Jones, Assistant Professor of Middle East Studies at Hamad bin Khalifa University. He was formerly at Exeter University and is a friend of Matthew Hedges. In London, Glenmore Trenor-Harvey is an intelligence analyst and writes on security issues. 
And joining us from Kuala Lumpur via Skype, Radha Sterling, founder and CEO of Detained in Dubai. A very warm welcome to all of you. Uh, Mark, we're talking here about a 31-year-old student on a two-week research trip. What was Matthew Hedges doing in the UAE? Matthew Hedges, like many uh, PhD students, was taking a short trip away from Durham University to conduct interviews. Uh, and this is a very common practice amongst PhD students doing political science or security studies. He would have had ethical approval from Durham University to carry out this trip. And within that process is the determination that what Matthew is doing is, is, is kosher and above board mm -hmm. and uh, above all things, safe and secure. So that's what Matthew would have been doing, arranging interviews with key people who would have been able to answer his approved research questions. What were his research questions? What was the nature of the research specifically? Well, as with many PhDs and as PhD students will know, the questions start off broad. So overall, he was looking at the impact of the Arab Spring on UAE and UAE security policy in particular. And this would not be uh, an unusual topic given the circumstances. In fact, there's many people looking at security mm. and many people are looking at Arabian Gulf countries and how they have reacted to the Arab Spring. It's very conventional. So we would have been looking at changes in policy, how the UAE, for example, might be safeguarding against similar events that happened in Bahrain happening in the UAE. Not unusual and not controversial. Depending on the nature of access, there could be sensitive issues discussed. But those issues would have been discussed, and as I said before, they would have been approved by the Ethics Committee at Durham University. OK. Uh, Glenmore, why would the UAE be concerned when it comes to this sort of research? I mean, how sensitive is it? You say, I mean, it is the security of the country itself. And I think that, if anything, uh, Hedges suffered from being too good. He knows uh, the Emirates. Uh, he had lived there. He had worked there. His uh, area of specialization, this isn't uh, economic uh, research that he is doing, he is actually asking about the most sensitive part of a country's uh, defense mechanism. And I think that uh, because he is obviously a very bright fellow, the nature of his questions uh, were far too penetrating. The Emirates themselves, uh, at the uh, start of this year, uh, decided to revamp, to upgrade their intelligence. And uh, the nature of the uh, conflict or dispute uh, uh, currently with Qatar, uh, together with the Saudis, makes uh, anything about the nature of their operation very, very concerning. And obviously, um, they don't know whether the Iranians have some influence over them. Uh, you have to see it from their point of view. And I have, quite frankly, when people are asking the sort of penetrating questions that he did in emirate terms, those are the sort of things that a spy would do. Right. Radha, just uh, give us an idea of how strict the UAE's national security laws are, especially as if Glenmore says that they have been upgraded. How might he have stepped over the line and, and broken a law if he was simply asking questions that had been cleared by his university on a research trip? Uh, from what we've seen over the past few years is the UAE has increased their uh, clamp down on essentially anything that could be seen as defamatory to the government. So if his research was in fact going to disclose any information that the UAE would consider defamatory, he would be subject to arrest. They've been extremely sensitive in other cases. And just two years ago, they arrested uh, two British men uh, accused of spying also. Uh, they were plane spotters and they were hobbyists taking uh, photos of, of an airport in the UAE. They were held again for a, at least four months before being finally released. Um, the UAE has been arresting anyone, uh, lawyers, activists, um, hu human rights um, in, in individuals and and. And, and jailing them essentially for saying anything that could be con considered negative. So this may not even come down to a security issue mm. so much as they don't appreciate any research that is defaming the country. OK, I mean, Mark, would, would Matthew not have been fully aware of this, given that he has been in and out of the country mm. since he was nine years old and indeed knowing full well about the current climate. Well, I think there's there's two sides to this. I think Matthew would have been very aware of any sensitivities to mm. his research. But at the same time, having grown up there, 
or having spent a lot of his life there with his family, he would have also felt familiar and relatively comfortable doing what he was doing. Because according to Matthew, it's, it's clear that he, he loves the UAE very much. Mm -hmm. And it, it wasn't in his nature to criticize the UAE necessarily. And if he did, it was, it was usually fair criticism. So I think he would even be surprised at the response that this has created. And I think what's really important to bear in mind, whilst I take on board what Glenmore was saying, and, and I don't doubt that um, Matthew's questions would have been um, penetrating and incisive, what the problem is, is when you have a situation, as we've seen now in, in the UAE, post-Arab uprisings, they're at war in Yemen, oh, naturally they're going to be more paranoid and suspicious. But what you see when you have a broadening of laws, security laws, as Zareta mentioned, and in general anti-terror laws, these do not discriminate based on someone asking very particular and discreet and incisive questions. The whole nature of anti-terror laws is to broaden the, the, the breadth of law and its application to broader crimes. So as I mentioned, the people who were jailed, jailed for plane spotting. Mm, mm. So there is a tendency when countries become paranoid and, and revamp their anti-terror laws to cast a wider net in anything that they deem suspicious. So I think this is the fundamental of the problem, is that the state has become more paranoid and the laws have subsequently become more broad and are applied more readily. Okay. Uh, Glenmore, the UAE argues that there was a free and transparent trial and indeed that they have compelling evidence proving their case. They say that there was espionage material found on a laptop. I mean, what might that look like? As I say, it could be, for example, as part of the revamp of the Emirates service, uh, that uh, he had asked about, well, who are you recruiting? Who are you getting new people? As I understand it, the uh, Emirates have been recruiting from one particular tribe. Now, uh, if he has knowledge of that, when you start asking these questions, the people you ask the questions of uh, suddenly say, Gosh, you know, the, 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 this is very sensitive. How does he know about that? I, I go back, I think uh, probably it is the uh, nature of his uh, uh, thoroughness, his diligence, uh, has uh, upset uh, the uh, security service. Because the people who have uh, placed these charges, I would suggest, are possibly not as bright as hedges, that they suddenly say, well, how does this chap know all of these uh, questions to ask? So uh, he would be uh, very diligent in keeping his notes. Where would he keep his notes? He would keep his notes on his laptop. So uh, ergo, when they look at his uh, laptop, they see these answers and think, uh, heavens, uh, he really does know a great deal about our uh, strategy. Uh, he knows um, uh, what relationship um, the Emirates have with the Saudi uh, intelligence services, and they're a, a pretty rum lot at the moment. Uh, so the, the combination is uh, a fairly secure. Uh, one of the things that the uh, description is of him as a spy, and there have been several commentators say, well, he's a British spy. Does he work for the British intelligence services? Absolutely not. You, know, that, uh, you could not imagine a British intelligence officer behaving in the fashion that he has. Mm. Uh, just give us an idea of, of whether the whether MI6, the British Intelligence Service, would ever consider using an academic to do spy work in somewhere like the UAE that it has good relations with. I, I, no. Uh, first and foremost, uh, uh, any intelligence gathering that uh, uh, the Secret Intelligence Service, MI6, do um, is far more subtle an awful lot of it would be through uh, electronic surveillance, uh, um, monitoring the digital uh, signatures of uh, material coming out of both friends uh, and hostile people. And at the moment, uh, the need to know precisely what uh, is happening in regard to the conflict in the Yemen, uh, the continuing uh, dispute um, with Qatar, uh, uh, is the sort of information that we want. Now, it seems to me that he was absolutely overt in uh, both the people that he went to uh, meet with, uh, the questions that he was asking. Now, uh, had he uh, just completed his studies, come back, uh, written his doctoral uh, thesis, 
then um, maybe, not just maybe, a number of intelligence services would like to see a copy of that published paper because uh, he is uh, quite literally looking at the Emirates security strategy. Mm. Uh, Rara, I'll come here in just a moment just to talk about the jail and, and the trial conditions. But first of all, Mark, I just want to get an idea of how common it might be for uh, the members of intelligence service, the British government, to want a debrief from someone working in the region in the area of academics. I mean, I think there's somewhat of a contradiction in saying that it would be unusual for Britain to, say, spy on an ally like the UAE, but also say that intelligence officers would be very interested in finding out what information someone like Matthew Hedges have. So I, I do think they would be interested because there is a lot going on now, obviously, with regards to not just the UAE and Yemen and Qatar, mm. but also, um, you know, potential commercial deals that might be happening in the UAE, which might be of interest, for example, to British companies. So I think there is always that interest in what is going on. Again, I think it would be rather, it's obviously absurd to, absurd to suggest that Matthew was working overtly for, for the intelligence services. For one, you don't just go around asking questions on sensitive nature and have a very poor cover story as Matthew did. Have you found any red lines when you've been conducting your field research in this region? Well, I mean, I think, th th for me, this is a familiar territory. But usually the procedures somewhat differ. So I myself cannot go back to Bahrain. Um, it's somewhere I grew up in and where I've done most of my research on. We know that the UAE has previously banned entry to academics before, such as Dr. Christian Ulrichsen, who's now at Rice University. So what is very common if people are thought to be critical of the UAE or maybe even um, discussing the UAE in sens or sensitive information about the UAE, they tend not to let them in mm. uh, or, or, or elsewhere in the Gulf. It's the same, as would happen with Christian, as happened with myself. So I think it's very interesting that they've decided to um, actually arrest Matthew, hold him in solitary confinement, um, and uh, I think that's unprecedented. I mean, as we've seen, we've, we've seen other people being arrested for, for crimes against sort of morality and in some cases um, spying. But I think this is a step change in mm. what the UAE are doing, especially towards a foreign national. And that's where I want to bring Rada back into the conversation because we know that he's been held um, for around about seven months, as Mark said, in solitary confinement for some of that period. His family has even said that he has been given a regular cocktail of drugs whilst in jail. I just want to get an idea from you if these are the sorts of stories and conditions that you've heard before uh, about jails in the UAE. Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, we've dealt with uh, in excess of 10,000 cases over the past decade. Um, what we see about this case is it's not really unusual, except that it's very high profile and extremely risky for diplomatic relations and also uh, the private sector and the academic community. It's certainly sending a clear message. But over the past 10 years, we have seen numerous um, examples of arbitrary arrests, um, arrests on the basis of suspicion or hearsay, one person's word, uh, with absolutely zero evidence. And we've seen the UAE authorities not even following their own constitution, their own legal process, their own statutes. And that means that they shouldn't be holding people for in excess of one year, for example, as they have done many times before to British nationals, without even charging them, without giving them due process. Um, Matthew Hedges has already been there for, for many months and now has only received a judgment today, again, after five minutes, which is not unusual. Most trials are, are lasting anywhere between sort of five and 15 minutes. And this is obviously an unacceptable duration for anyone to stand a chance at proving their innocence. Um, the United Kingdom will not extradite anyone to the UAE based on the true risk of um, unfair trials, discrimination, corruption in the legal system, human rights violations, and even torture. So if the UK doesn't trust their legal system to extradite criminals mm. or even people that they believe to be guilty, then obviously there's a problem with the UAE system. OK, I mean, of course, the uh, UAE... The well, just to jump in there for a moment, because, of course, the UAE insists that it has followed... Uh, the legal system to the letter, and it's now at the point where the family has asked for clemency, which, again, it says was, is within the judicial system, and that this is something that the UAE is now considering at the highest level. Is that also common procedure? Uh, it is common procedure. It's become more common in the past six to 12 months for the UAE to make an allegation against someone, and in in... Times past, when there was a diplomatic incident like this, 
the rulers would step in and release that person and almost apologize for having detained them without evidence in the first place. Now what we're seeing is a different pattern where they would prefer to convict that person, say that they have evidence against that person, and then offer them a pardon so that the UAE looks better in front of the international media and the evidence that they apparently had is not contested. And in this case, uh, the UAE has said that they have a signed confession. In our experience, um, forced confessions are the norm in the UAE, and confessions are signed in Arabic without a translator, so we can't take them seriously either. Glenmore, there is something of a very blurry red line here, isn't there? I mean, on the one hand, we've got the Emirates painting itself as an open, free society that uh, warmly welcomes all, all foreigners, Westerners, and yet we're frequently hearing of foreigners being locked up for various different offences. How difficult is it to know when one has stepped over the line? Well, I, uh, exceedingly so. I, the, the thing that uh, uh, I've been thinking about is uh, a journalist. By definition, you go and ask questions. Mm. And uh, if the answer you get is, uh, uh, you know, uh, not satisfactory, you probe further. That often results in the person who is being questioned taking offence. And if he is a national or an official of that country, it is uh, quite easy um, uh, to take umbrage and to uh, convert that umbrage into some sort of allegation. And the thing is that uh, any uh, journalist or any businessman going into a, a market will ask questions. They will conduct due diligence. They will want to find out. And as I say, I think in the case of Hedges, dealing in a, the most sensitive of areas, the security strategy of a country who, uh, as a country, feel that they are currently under threat uh, because of their engagement in Yemen and because of the conflict they mm. have with Qatar, uh, he, in a sense, is just too good at his job. Mark, this is a warning, isn't it, to academics? Um, even if you want, if even mm. the UAE means it as such, it's certainly going to give many people pause for thought. Would you feel happy going to the UAE to conduct research at the moment? No, I'm, I certainly wouldn't. And I know a number of my colleagues, um, many of whom study the Gulf in various disciplines, also feel the same way. Mm. Um, they are feeling increasingly reluctant about going to the United Arab Emirates. And as you said, the intention here isn't important. Regardless of whether Matthew is, is, is released, and I think he will be, um, the, he's still been in prison for five to six months, much of which has been in solitary confinement in appalling conditions without proper due process. So regardless of, of whether this is resolved in a way that is, is a best possible outcome now, he has still had to endure psychological trauma for such a large amount of time that that is enough to intimidate anyone wishing to do research on the UE, whether they're an academic or even a journalist. I mean, the UAE's got a number of foreign universities or links to foreign universities, hasn't Absolutely. it? I mean, it, it seemed to have encouraged academic freedoms. Well, I mean, what's interesting about the United Arab Emirates is prior to the Matthew Hedges issues blowing up, for example, Birmingham University in the UK was opening a campus. Um, now those uh, people in Birmingham are going to walk out in protest against mm. the creation of a Birmingham uh, campus because of the Matthew Hedges. Although prior to that, they were also concerned that the rights of LGBT students wouldn't be guaranteed because of the, the national laws in that country. So there have been these tensions before between Western universities and the United Arab Emirates. And there have been other issues where um, free speech has, or the lack of free speech has been criticized on these campuses. So it, it, it is a delicate issue for um, you know, New York University, for example, NYU, mm. uh, and obviously Birmingham, uh, about how they um, negotiate their relationship with countries that obviously don't adhere to the same standards of academic freedom. Radha, do you, do you share the optimism of Mark that Hedges will be released? Are the signs pointing towards that? Uh, it, it seems in my experience that when there is so much international press pressure, um, there, there's certainly concern amongst the private sector and the governments in, in the UK, in the United States and, and our allies, um, I think that the UAE really has no choice but to reach a diplomatic solution and uh, hopefully Hedges will be home soon. Um, uh, just touching on, on freedom there, freedom, I mean, his academic research is akin to uh, a journalist and freedom of speech. The UAE ranks extremely low in the, um, uh, the annual rankings of uh, freedom of press 
And most journalists who work in the country are unable to ask questions that could be considered in any way detrimental to the country. And the same goes for researchers. So it's certainly sending a message that the UAE is much more strict than we would imagine uh, our ally to be. Uh, fascinating. Very interesting indeed. Thank you very much, all of you, for joining us for the discussion today. Mark Owen Jones, uh, Glenmore Tra Trainer Harvey and Radha Serling. And thank you too very much for watching. You can see this programme again anytime it's by visiting our website, that's aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, do go to our Facebook page, that's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Laura Kyle, and the whole team here, it's bye for now. <laughs>